Jamaica's history has been shaped by slavery and colonialism. It went from a Spanish colony to a British one with a long tradition of resistance throughout, and yet it did not gain independence until 1962. Since then, its path has been uneven. To see why, join me for this brief explainer on the history and politics of Jamaica. The Spanish were the first Europeans to set eyes on the island, when Christopher Columbus and his men landed there in 1494. What they encountered was a group of local Tainos, subsistence farmers who organized themselves into communal villages and called their home Zamaca, or land of wood and water. After a brief stay, Columbus claimed the island for Spain and christened it Santo Iago. He would be back nearly a decade later, when on his fourth and final voyage to the Americas, on his way to Hispaniola, his warm-eaten ships became no longer seaworthy around St. Anne's Bay, and he ended up marooned in the island for nearly a year. While he sent men to Hispaniola for help, he and his crew lived off the goodwill of his Taino hosts. According to Spanish chronicles, the Tainos eventually tired of providing for them, but Columbus was able to frighten back into submission when after consulting his almanac, he predicted that their vengeful god would show his anger with a sign in the sky. The lunar eclipse, of course, came to pass, and Columbus and his men were able to survive until help reached them from Hispaniola. It would not be the last time the Spanish would force the Tainos to provide them tribute. In later years, when the Spanish crown terminated the claims of Columbus's heirs to the entire Caribbean, as part of the settlement, it made Jamaica a fiefdom of Luis Colón de Toledo, Columbus's grandson. Even now, the title of Marquis of Jamaica is held by Columbus's descendants. Meanwhile, once the Spanish decimated the Tainos as a result of their enslavement and ill-treatment, in 1517, the Spanish began introducing kidnapped Africans as laborers. But lacking gold or much else, the colony languished, as a post for provisioning ships between Spain and Central America. The first settlement had been in the northern part of the island, in Sevilla La Nueva, but by 1534, the Spanish moved their capital further south into Villa de la Vega, now called Spanish Town. Given the overall lack of interest in the colony, however, it was poorly defended, so in 1654, when Oliver Cromwell sent an expedition to invade Hispaniola as part of his design to disrupt the Spanish trade monopoly in the Caribbean, and this failed, the English forces turned south and attacked Jamaica. On May 10, 1655, under the leadership of Sir William Penn, they finally succeeded. From that point on, Jamaica would remain under British control well into the 20th century. Not that British authority was unchallenged. In the early years, they had to deal with a small band of Spanish loyalists who were eventually completely defeated at the Battle of Rio Nuevo in 1660. The much longer problem would be the Cimarrones, or Maroons in English, enslaved people who had managed to escape in the wake of the invasion, who took to the hills and defended their freedom fiercely. In those early decades of English rule, the colony began to prosper, though. Because Spanish town had been so severely damaged in the invasion, the capital was unofficially moved to Port Royal, where a trading economy boomed. As a plantation economy developed around cocoa, coffee, and sugar cane, settlement increased. By 1662, there were 4,000 colonists on the island, including exiled felons as well as impoverished Scots and Welshmen who arrived as indentured laborers. Because the British were constantly at war with the French, Spanish, or Dutch throughout the 17th century, they began sponsoring privateers to capture enemy vessels, raid their settlements, and contribute their plunder to the British Crown's coffers. These buccaneers evolved as a motley band of seafaring miscreants, ex-slaves, heretics, political refugees, and escaped criminals. They grew into a powerful and ruthless force, feared throughout the Antilles, even by their English sponsors. Initially, the new governor of Jamaica, Sir Thomas Modiford, joined with the Spanish in attempts to suppress the buccaneers. But the outbreak of the Second Dutch War against Holland and Spain in March 1664 forced England to rethink its policy. Marty Ford arranged for the buccaneers to defend Jamaica. They left the island of Tortuga and Port Royal became their base. Their numbers swelled astronomically, and within a decade Port Royal was Jamaica's largest city and one of the largest British cities in the New World second only to Boston, a place famous for its gaudy displays of wealth and loose morals. With England at peace with Spain, 
buccaneers were now regarded merely as pirates. Mother Nature lent a hand in their suppression when a massive earthquake struck Port Royal on June 7, 1692, toppling much of the city into the sea. More than 2,000 people, one-third of the Port Royal population, perished, and many survivors fled and founded Kingston, believing the earthquake to be punishment from God. All the while, Jamaica's English elite had grown immensely wealthy from sugar and from the trade in kidnapped Africans. Of the estimated 11 million enslaved people who survived the transatlantic crossing, around 1.5 million ended up in Jamaica, the large part of whom originated in West Africa. The trip was brutal. It lasted anywhere from 6 to 12 weeks in cramped and festering holds where many died of disease. Those who survived the voyage were made more presentable in oil to make them appear healthy before being auctioned. Bidders paid between 25 and 75 pounds for kidnapped Africans, perhaps 300 or more for those trained as carpenters or blacksmiths, and no more than a shilling for the most wretched. From Kingston, the kidnapped Africans were re-exported to other Caribbean islands. The slave ships then returned to England, carrying cargoes of sugar, molasses, and rum. It was cruel and immensely profitable, but it also meant that there was the constant risk that enslaved people might rebel. The first major slave uprising occurred in 1690 in Clarendon Parish, where many enslaved people escaped and joined the Maroons, who had fought off the British for decades. These groups were concentrated in the remote Blue Mountains and in cockpit country of southern Trelawney, from where they raided plantations and attracted others who sought freedom. The eastern community became known as the Windward Maroons. Those further west were called Leeward Maroons. In 1729, the British attempted to eradicate the Maroons once and for all. They launched an offensive that came to be known as the First Maroon War. The thickly forested mountains, however, were ill-suited to English-style open warfare, and the Maroons had perfected ambush-style guerrilla fighting. Nonetheless, after a decade of costly campaigning, the British gained the upper hand, enough to negotiate a truce. On March 1, 1739, Colonel Guthrie and Cujo, the leader of the Maroons of Cockpit Country, agreed to a deal where the Maroons would gain autonomy and 1,500 acres of land in exchange for helping the British put down rebellions and return any enslaved person who might seek freedom among the Maroons. The Maroons of the Lou Mountains, under a leader named Quao, signed a similar treaty one year later. These deals were absolutely crucial for the British because by the late 18th century, Jamaica had become the largest sugar producer in the world, the profits of which depended heavily on enslaved labor. The planters built sturdy great houses in Georgian fashion, high above their cane fields. Many planters were absentee landlords who lived most of the year in England, where they formed a powerful political lobby. In Jamaica, the planters lived a life of indolence, with retinues of black servants. Many overindulged and drank, and had sexual relations with slaves. Some of the mulatto offspring were freed, known as quote-unquote free coloreds. They were accorded special rights and often sent to study in Europe. By 1700, there were perhaps 7,000 Englishmen and 40,000 enslaved people in Jamaica. A century later, the number of whites had tripled and they ruled over 300,000 enslaved. Tens of thousands were worked to death, many building factories, houses, and roads, most working on plantations. Others were domestic servants. Some planters showed kindness and nurtured their slaves, but most resorted to violence to terrorize the enslaved population into obedience. The extreme treatment was eventually regulated, but plantation society remained tied to the rule of the whip. Not surprisingly, and even despite the treaties the British established with the Maroons, there were constant rebellions. There was Tacky's War in 1760, a rebellion led by a Ghanaian man in the northeastern part of the island, and a second Maroon War in 1795. But the largest of all was the Baptist War, an insurrection that lasted 11 days and began on December 27, 1831. Led by Samuel Sharp, it involved somewhere between 60 and 300,000 enslaved people. At first, it was a peaceful general strike demanding better working conditions. But once reprisals by the plantation owners occurred, the enslaved began burning crops. This, in turn, led British authorities to put down the rebellion swiftly and brutally. Hundreds of rebels were killed, but even after the rest surrendered, 
the plantation owners made sure to make an example out of them. The cruelty was such, however, that this paved the way for the British Parliament to pass the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. It would still take a while for all restrictions to be lifted, but finally, unconditional emancipation of chattel slavery would take place in 1838. Abolition improved a lot of those who had been enslaved only marginally. For one, although now paid, wages remained quite low. For another, the British, afraid of what might happen if the former slaves gained power, introduced high poll taxes to restrict their voting. By 1864, in a population of 436,000, where blacks outnumbered whites 32 to 1, only around 2,000 blacks were eligible to vote. Add several floods and a two-year widespread drought prior to 1865 to the widespread poverty, and the economic and political conditions were turning the island into a powder keg. It finally exploded on October 6, 1865. Once again, a process that began peacefully and was led by a Baptist preacher, this time Paul Bogle, soon turned into a wider rebellion. Bogle had intended to march along with the crowd to the courthouse in Moran Bay to have their grievances heard, but after a government's volunteer militia killed a few of the protesters, the enraged crowd burned down the courthouse and several nearby buildings. For the next two days, the rebellion grew, and a total of 25 people died. In response, Governor Edward John Erie declared martial law and proceeded to execute the rebels and leaders like Bogle, along with many innocent people, including women and children. One of those who had nothing to do with the rebellion but was killed anyway was wealthy businessman George William Gordon, one of the local representatives. Some members of the British government were so outraged by the governor's actions that Erie was subsequently stripped of his post and Jamaica was made a crown colony, that is, one directly ruled by the British Parliament. In the following decades, Jamaica would see dramatic change. One was the transfer of the capital from Spanish Town to Kingston in 1872. Another was a shift from sugar to banana production. The banana trade began in earnest in 1866 when an American, George Bush, began taking bananas to Boston for profit. Within a decade, the trade was booming. It peaked in 1921 when 21 million stems were exported. The banana business also expanded the tourism business, as banana traders looked to defray the cost of transport. So they began to promote the virtues of the island and began to take on passengers. This, however, would not become a major source of GDP for Jamaica until the 1950s. In the meantime, Jamaica's black and disenfranchised population continued to demand changes and began creating a new social and political identity. Two of the most influential movements from the early 20th century were black nationalism and Rastafarianism. The first was best exemplified by Marcus Garvey, who believed that black people needed to secure financial independence from white people and founded Jamaica's first modern political party in 1929. The second was an Afrocentric, Abrahamic variant religion that believed that Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia fulfilled a biblical prophecy and which promoted the idea of Africa as Zion, or the Promised Land. At first, mainly concentrated among the most impoverished people in Jamaica, Rastafarianism gained respectability and visibility in the 1960s and 1970s because of the popularity of Bob Marley and other reggae musicians. It was two particular men, however, who would end up having more concrete political impact on the island. Their names were Norman Manley and Alexander Bustamante, a pair of cousins who began their political ascent in the 1930s in the wake of the Great Depression and who would fight separately for economic and political reforms. The watershed moment was the 1938 labor riots. These were strikes and unrest that occurred as a result of a lack of steady jobs that were also poorly paid and which at its peak had the participation of roughly 20,000 people who paralyzed Kingston for several days. Bustamante was one of the original leaders and was quickly jailed for his trouble for 17 months. Once freed, he founded an influential trade union known as the BITU or Busta Union. Meanwhile, Manley supported the movement and worked to have universal suffrage and autonomy granted to the island. The former was finally granted in 1944 and in 1947, virtual autonomy was granted. 
though Jamaica remained a British colony under the jurisdiction of Parliament and the Crown, a prelude to full independence. This process, known as constitutional decolonization, finally culminated on August 6, 1962, when Jamaica became fully independent. The new flag was about to be hoisted over the stadium, the higher rank in accord with the new status of Jamaica as full member of the Commonwealth. Period, Bustamante and Manly founded the two political parties that have gone on to dominate Jamaican politics since then. These are the Jamaican Labour Party, or JLP, founded by Bustamante, and the People's National Party, founded by Manly. Every single Prime Minister in Jamaican history has been a member of one or the other, three for the PNP, six for the JLP. The Jamaican Labour Party, although with vast historical ties to labor, is the most conservative of the two, and is currently ruling Jamaica under the leadership of its Premier, Andrew Holness. But that was still in the future. Political competition right before and right after Jamaica's independence was a direct contest between Bustamante and Manly, with Manly becoming the first Premier in 1959 and Bustamante the first Prime Minister after independence in 1962. But Bustamante had a stroke in 1965 and retired from active public life, and Norman Manley died in 1969, and thus, from that time on, the debate has been shaped by their legacies, but no longer directly between the two men. Manley's son, Michael, led the PNP towards democratic socialism in the mid-70s. His policy of taxation to fund social services deterred foreign investment and caused capital flight at a time when Jamaica could ill afford it. Bitterly opposed factions engaged in open urban warfare before the 1976 election. A controversial state of emergency was declared, and the nation seemed poised on the edge of a civil war. But the PNP won the election by a wide margin, and Manley continued with his socialist agenda. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. government was hostile to Jamaica's socialist turn, and when Manley began to develop close ties with Cuba, the CIA purportedly planned to topple the Jamaican government. Businesses pulled out, the economy went into sharp decline, and the country was under virtual siege. Almost 800 people were killed in the lead-up to the 1980 elections, which were won by the JLP's Edward Siga. Siga restored Jamaica's economic fortune somewhat, severed ties with Cuba, and became a staunch ally of the Reagan administration. Relatively peaceful elections in 1989 returned a reinvented manly to power. He retired in 1992, handing the reins to his deputy, Percival James Patterson, Jamaica's first black prime minister. The Patterson-led PNP triumphed in the 1993 and 1997 elections. In spring of 1999, the country erupted in nationwide riots after the government announced a 30% increase in the tax on gasoline. Kingston and Montego Bay, where sugar canes were set ablaze, were particularly badly hit. After three days of arson and looting, the government resigned the tax. In the lead-up to the 2002 elections, violence in West Kingston soared to new heights, as criminal posses battle to control electoral turf and profit from the largesse that victory at the polls in Jamaica brings. Rival political gangs turned the area into a war zone, forcing residents to flee and school businesses and even Kingston Public Hospital to close. In 2004, Hurricane Ivan bounced off Jamaica en route to the Cayman Islands, causing widespread damage. And Edward Siga, still representing the JLP as opposition leader, retired after over three decades of life in politics. Two years later, Prime Minister Patterson resigned, giving way to Portia Simpson Miller, Jamaica's first female Prime Minister, and Michael Manley's protege. Mama P was initially popular with the masses, but 18 years of PNP rule bred voter disillusionment with the party. In the 2007 elections, Bruce Golding of the JLP carried the day, inheriting high rates of crime and illiteracy as well as threats to the environment through deforestation and overdevelopment. Problems with criminal organizations have continued. One of the most infamous events was when Jamaica tried to extradite Christopher Duddes Koch, the most powerful gangster and drug trafficker in Jamaica in 2010. Between May 24th and 27 of that year, heavy fighting broke out between Duddes's gunmen and the Joint Police Military Force, leaving 67 dead. Dadas himself remained on the road for a month before being apprehended, disguised as a woman at a roadblock. He was eventually convicted in the District of New York and sentenced to 23 years in prison, 
Since then, the homicide rate has gone down, but still remains one of the highest in the world. Meanwhile, Jamaica's economy had been growing in the 1990s and 2000s. It slowed down in the 2010s and has remained nearly flat in the last few years before COVID. The pandemic hit the island particularly hard, especially the slowdown in tourism, in a country whose poverty rate was already high. Thus, as Jamaica approaches its 60th year of independence, it faces massive challenges with regard to crime and lifting its people out of poverty. Whether the island will be able to do much about it remains to be seen.